everybody. Thank you for tuning in. We are on episode 8 of 20. I do have all 20 videos mapped out. I wasn't quite sure how I was going to get there, but now I do know how to get there because I like all forms of Omaha, and I'll get into those in a little bit. But episode 8 is titled Dry Ace and Blockers. First of all, I just want to thank everybody who's been watching. Uh, right now we have over 500 subscribers. We started off with uh, just a little over 100 uh, when I decided to do this. And um, yeah, we've had lots of comments, lots of likes. Please feel free to share the video. If you got a moment right now and you're not subscribed, go ahead and hit the like and subscribe button. I definitely appreciate it. Uh, we are gonna start incorporating some live play. Now just keep in mind that I live in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So for me, when it comes to live play, I always have to travel. So one of the things that's gonna happen is I'm gonna start incorporating some live play. Matter of fact, I'm looking at having a, a home game specifically Omaha, this coming Monday uh, in Traverse City. So if you're in the Traverse City area, hit me up on Facebook, send me a message uh, on Monday. It's probably gonna be something like a 125 straddle for 10 uh, with a thousand dollar max buy-in or we'll do a match the stack, something to that effect. Um, I heard it's a really, really juicy game there uh, because they don't have any other games there that are, are uh, Palin and Omaha in the area. All they have apparently, I think, is Odawa for uh, two five no and hold them and it only goes on Friday. So if you do want to play with me, uh, that's a video that I'm planning on incorporating in to give you guys some examples. Obviously, I don't know what's going to happen yet. Uh, hopefully, I can show you what some blocker bats look like, what some feeler bat looks like. Hopefully, I can throw in a dry ace there. Um, but that's the title of this episode is Dry Ace and Blockers. And um, what I'm going to tell you right now is something I've said when you flop bottom set or somebody said, hey, professor, can you talk about flopping bottom two pair and how to proceed with that? So if you have a dry ace and you have blockers, just be aware that you need to proceed with a little bit of caution, okay? And there's specific ways to play dry aces and there's specific ways that you need to play blockers. And uh, I'll give you a couple of examples where, you know, dry aces have paid off for me in the long run. And I'll give you a couple of examples where they've cost me a lot in the long run. And that happens. And you have to be okay with that. Because at the end of the day, if you look back and you say, I played the hand appropriately. It's the only way I could win the hand or whatever the case may be. And you lost and the other person made a hero call. Congratulations. You know, they scoop a big pot. But in any case, so what is a dry ace? A dry ace is essentially any ace and no suits to go with it, okay? And uh, for those of you who are familiar with Potlum at Omaha, obviously you all know that for Hold'em, as you know, if you've got four hearts on the board, uh, you know, and you just have the ace of hearts, you have the nuts, but in Omaha, of course, you need two cards to play. So there's a few things you need to know when you have a dry ace. Um, the most important thing is, is you have to pretend or bluff or bet or whatever you want to call it uh, as if you have it you have it suited okay so all of your actions have to determine that so now this is one of those things where you have to take inventory of yourself okay and I do this throughout a session uh, where I'll realize I'm picking up on my own tells if you've played poker long enough you'll realize like sometimes the way you riffle chips might be a specific tell. Whether or not you look down at your chips right away might be a specific tell. You know, whether or not you're breathing really fast or heavy might be a specific tell. I mentioned the jugular vein. Uh, believe it or not, there are some people that, especially if they're sitting to your right and you look at them and their jugular vein is just like boom, 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 and you're like, oh my God, this guy's got a monster. I better get out of the way. But in any case, you have to pretend or bluff or bet as if you have it suited. And it's really important the second thing, and this is probably the biggest key factor, whenever you're looking at playing with a dry ace or blockers, and I'll get into what blockers in in a minute, the second key factor is pay attention. This is very important. This is important anytime you're playing any kind of poker, but this is especially important when you're playing pot limit Omaha, because when you're playing pot limit Omaha, this is something you need to know all the time, because it determines whether or not your dry ace or your blockers is going to pay off. Pay attention to what? What was that in the back? Oh, Johnny. Johnny in the back got it. Pay attention to the stack size. Good job, Johnny. The stack size, okay? This is in so incredibly important. And the reason why is let's say you have a hand like uh, ace, seven, eight, nine, 
and the ace is unsuited, okay? But let's say you have a different suit, it doesn't matter. You're playing it because it's on the button and you have button principle. Keep in mind all these pertain to a one, two, five straddle for 10, bring it in, in a starting stack of $1,000. Now, if you have a hand like, say the ace of hearts, let's just give it something instead of a squiggly line here. Ace of hearts, seven, eight, nine. And say the flop comes up, uh, let's just say it comes up, deuce of hearts, nine of hearts, and say you throw in like the queen of clubs out there, okay? This is a pretty draw heavy board. Obviously 10 jack, king, eight, 10 jack, those are gonna be all your wraps. Somebody could have a set of queens. Eh, unlikely somebody's got a set of nines, but we put that nine in there so that way you can have a plan B in case everything goes wrong. But in any case, and you have two hearts, if you're first to act, you have to say to yourself, so what would I do if I had the suited ace? And you have to act accordingly. Now, before you do that, you need to look around the table and see what everybody's chip stack size is. Because say, for example, you're on an average table. Again, you got four people and there's about $120 in the pot, okay? Uh, that means everybody's got about 30, everybody has about 970 left over, whatever the case may be. If, if little Susie over here or Kelly or Dave, say Dave likes to do a short buy-in and Dave only has like $300 in his stack, you might not get away with betting a dry ace. And the reason why is flop comes up like this, there's 120 in the pot. If you're first to act, of course, we all know what to do if you're last to act, right? I don't have to go into that again. Pot, they all check to you, pot. But if you're first to act and uh, there's 120 in the pot, you're still gonna do a, a blocker slash feeler. Somebody said it was a pro bet, one of those things. You're gonna do one of those bets where you're gonna bet somewhere between 60 and 75 bucks. Again, your bet size tells PLO players, this is what I'm holding on, and, and, and if you wanna raise me, you can, but then you have a good idea. Um, unless you are the type of player who's been mixing in some of those when you have the stone cold nuts and all of a sudden you have a set of queens. But in any case, in this situation, we don't have a set of queens, we just have a dry ace. So say you bet 60 bucks, and you end up with two callers, okay? So again, we go $300 to the turn, and let's say the turn uh, whether it hits your hand or it doesn't, the most important key factor you have to pay attention to, and I can't stress this enough, is stack size. Because let's say the, the jack of hearts comes on the turn, and little Dave over here, who had 300 in his stack, now only has 240. If you do a pot size bet at that time, or just say, you know, ah, you know what, I'm going to bet 275 or 225, somewhere around there. And all of a sudden Dave goes, you know what? I got a, a set of queens or I've got a set of ducks. Um, or Dave might be like, ah, I got the king high flush draw. I got the king high flush. You know what? He's looking down at his tips. He's like, it's only $240 for me to win another, you know, 300 plus another 225. So he's like, okay, so it's gonna cost me 240 bucks to win 540. He's like, I only gotta be right one out of three times, actually one out of four times to break even, one out of three times when I'm making money, I'll go ahead and take a chance. So again, if Dave here has a small stack size, your dry ace, no good. You can bet on the flop and if the heart comes, you gotta look at Dave and you gotta read his soul. And you gotta, gotta determine, is Dave the type of player to call off the rest of his chips for $240? or 270 or whatever the case may be. Dave might be that type of player. Um, and if you've seen him do it, then then don't, 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 don't try it, okay? So here's a key factor in dry aces. Pay attention to sack size, this goes, this goes along with blockers too. Uh, and then the third other factor that you have to pay attention to with dry aces is calling stations, okay? And first of all, in Palom and Omaha, we love calling stations. We absolutely love calling stations. Calling stations are our friend. Calling stations is how we make money. We like calling stations. But when we have a dry ace, we don't like calling stations. It's that simple. Everybody follow? Good. You got it in the back there too? Okay, he's got it in the back. If you have somebody who's already called off, say three barrels, or he's drawn, like the board again is deuce nine queen with two hearts, and you've already had somebody who jams on, on another individual and they have something like a combo draw. Like if they got eight, 10 jack with hearts, I don't blame them for ripping it in there. I'd probably rip it in there too. But let's just say they have just hearts and a gut shot. Let's say they have king 10, both with hearts because it's high heart draw. And then, then say they got like four or four. Say they, they haven't applied all the principles I've been preaching here and they're hoping they hit their set of fours. 
But in any case, in a situation like that, you can make some arguments that, yeah, somebody should probably call, peel off. I don't mind a call here on the turn, but if it comes a heart, uh, you know, instead of the jack of hearts, say the turn comes something like the six of hearts, okay? Uh, if this person is a calling station, don't try to get them off the hand, okay? Now, if you have an image on the table that you're playing really tight, keep in mind everything's situational, you can try to get the calling station off, but I'm just telling you right now, it ain't worth it. And there's some places like Texas and Detroit, it ain't worth it. Um, it very rarely will I bet in the state of Texas or most of Michigan with a dry ace, okay? The reason why is just people will call you calling stations. It's, it's why we play the game. It's why we love it. Now, all of these principles are going to apply on blockers as well, okay? Now, what are blockers? Blockers are when you have a hand like, say you have jack-jack, uh, ace three, and say the ace is suited, okay? And the board comes something like, uh, it could be a number of things. It could be eight, nine, ten. Uh, it could be nine, ten, queen. Um, it could be obviously ten, queen. Well, it could be ten, queen, king because then you got the nuts. But you know, say it's uh, eight, ten, queen. These are all hands in which, when you have a pair or three of a kind, now by any means of the imagination, I am not here to tell people to play three of a kind in your hand. I've seen it done, and I've seen it done successfully. Uh, usually it's when they're on the button or, or in the cutoff, which is right before the button. But in any case, a blocker is usually when you have a pair in your hand, but you don't complete the straight. So on a board like 8, 9, 10, if you have two jacks, you got to keep in mind, all the hands that should have a jack here should be hands like 9, 10, jack, queen, or jack, queen, king, ace, or, you know, 9, jack, queen, king, any combination of that. You can also have... Any other hands that have a jack might be like jack, jack, x, x, which in somebody else could have a pair of jacks, and I've seen that happen a couple of times. But anytime you have a pair that is blocking, that's why we call it blockers, blocking the nuts, okay, you have to start betting just like you have it. When you have jack, jack, ace, three, and the board comes eight, nine, ten, and you go four ways to the flop, or nine, ten, queen, or eight, ten, queen, we're assuming all of these are, are rainbow flops, um, and even if they're not rainbow flops, that's okay. If you have two to a suit, that's even, if they have two to a suit, or if there's two to a suit on the board, that might even be better because even if they don't believe you that you have the straight, or even if they do believe you that they have the straight, and the turn comes a blank and the river comes a blank, then you can just triple barrel bluff, and then they'll end up mucking it. Again, the key principles that you need to know, pay attention to stack size. I can't tell you how, mu how much it's going to save you, even if... You're a little new and it gets on you and you've got blockers and your last act, you can look around the table before you bet. Say for example, you were playing a, a, something on your phone, playing a game on your phone or responding to a text and then all of a sudden uh, it goes check, check, check and it's on you and you're like, oh God, oh my God, I forgot how many, I, for, I forgot what the stack sizes are. You can just take a moment, you don't have to act super quick and just be like, ah, sir, I can't see your chips over there and you can even do that and it might look like you're doing that because you have a bluffable hand like blockers and you can mix that in, especially if somebody's going to look at that and pick up a, a tell or a read on you. When you have the nuts, you can do the same thing. Be like, uh, what are all the stacks? Like? What, what do you have over there, miss? Oh, you've got $300. Okay. Uh, but so pay attention to stack size and pay attention to calling stations. Okay. One thing that I found out is some people, and, and this just goes along with when you first sit down at a table, I can't stress this enough, especially if you've never played, like if you play at the same PLO game every week, whether like it's at a charity room or MGM or whatever the case may be, or in Texas or at a house game, you're going to have a good idea of who's the calling stations and who the guys who are like crushing it or the ladies. But in a situation when you first sit down and you're brand new at a table, don't look at your phone, at least for the first hour, just pay attention. You're going to find out, oh, God, the guy over there in the third seat, that person's a calling station. God, the girl over there in seat seven, she plays super tight. This is crazy. Okay? Just pay attention because those are the people that you know how to adjust your game based on blockers and dry aces. Okay? And I'll give you a, a good example of one hand that had both blockers and dry aces, 
in which case uh, I ended up losing the hand, but that's okay. Um, and uh, uh, I played it appropriately, so I was okay with it. But I was playing 5-5 five, five with the rock. So it was 5-5-10, five, five, and then you can straddle the rock for 20. This was at the win in Vegas, okay? And the gentleman that I was playing with, I had just sat down. Um, there's a couple people that I've played that know me pretty well. And uh, I had a dry ace of diamonds. Ace of diamonds. I can't even remember what the rest of my hand was. I just knew I had a dry ace of diamonds. And the flop came four, five, six with two diamonds, okay? And we went, it was five ways to the flop for 20 bucks. So we had $100 in the pot. And on five ways to the flop, the very first guy opens for $100. He just pots it. And I am last to act, okay? It's really important. I've already covered position. It's so important. But I'm last to act. So he bets 100 and it goes call, call, call call and I'm like okay I'm like I don't mind playing the dry ace principle like if I had enough diamond draw I'd play it with the same the same way oh, I remember what I had. I had I had one diamond and then I had spades I had two spades in my hand one of them was a king uh it was king x of spades I remember that because the flop came four five six with two diamonds and one spade and then the turn puts up the ten of spades that was the turn card and I was like oh my god I actually have a lot of equity here what happens five ways, it goes check, check, check. The fourth guy, keep in mind, the board is four, five, six, ten. Now it's got two diamonds and two spades out there. The fourth guy bets 500. We got $600 in the pot. And again, you have to look at the stack size because if the guy's only got like, if he bets 500 and he's only got 400 left, you're not going to get him off the hand, okay, with a dry ace. You're just, it's just not going to happen. But when he bets 500, I look at his stack size and he's got like three grand behind and I've got like three grand behind. I'm like, okay, I can make a $500 call here. If a diamond comes up, I should be able to win the pot. If a spade comes up, I'm going to win the pot. I think this guy's got seven, eight. And I said, and it's my first time playing with him. I've only been sitting at the table for maybe like 20 minutes or so. So I go ahead and call. So there's like $1,600 uh, in the pot, okay? And everybody else folds. And the river, I kid you not, puts out the jack of diamonds. And I'm like, oh, I'm okay with that. And he checks, and I go in the tank, like I'm trying to posture. Sometimes when I have the stone cold nuts on the river, I go in the tank for a long time. Sometimes I just say, pop, real quick. So I go in the tank, and I say, what's in the pot? And the dealer says, oh, it's 1600 And I think it might have been like 1635 but it's $1,600. And I said, I'll go ahead and bet pot. So I go ahead and bet pot, which was $1,600. And the guy goes in the tank forever. And I already told you, I lose the hand. But what the guy had on a four, five, six board, the guy had seven, seven, queen. I can't remember his fourth card, X, but he had two diamonds. He had the seven queen of diamonds. So it was one of those situations where he was trying to bluff at the pot with sevens uh, as, a, as a blocker bet. He recognized on the turn when I went check, check, check that everybody had weakness. And he says, I've got blockers. If I bet, the only person I really should be worried about is the guy right behind me. Uh, and maybe the first person who opened because they might have like deuce three to call uh, or they might have a set. When I call and everybody else folds, he can start narrowing down my range and say, well, he called on the flop. He called on the turn. Uh, river comes uh, a diamond. Does he really have it? And he went in the tank, I think it was like a solid two minutes, and then he ended up calling with Queen High Diamonds, and he was good. But that's okay. Sometimes you're gonna lose hands like that, and the best part about Omaha, again, is if you're playing the hand appropriately, and your opponents are playing the hand appropriately, uh, people can win, people can lose, and, and no one did it wrong. Um, where in Hold'em, it's, it's a little bit different. If everybody plays perfect in Hold'em, the only person who wins is the house. If everybody plays perfect in Omaha, you're, you will have a winner and a loser. So I shouldn't say only the house, but you guys get, get the general theory. So that's dry ace and blockers. Again, dry ace is when you have an ace with no suit. I always cover like a little synopsis. This is gonna be a short one, guys. That's okay. Uh, you gotta, everything you do, you have to pretend like you have it. You just have to act like you have it. Whether you have the straight, whether you, whether you pretend you have the straight or you pretend you have the ace, pay attention to your mannerisms because as you start doing these things with dry aces and blockers, you're going to start, as you move up in stakes, you go from 1, 2, 5, and I'll be covering 5, 10, 20 uh, in, a, in a few episodes. But as you start moving up in stakes, 
you're going to start realizing that your mannerisms, people pick up on. People aren't playing their phones in PLO as often as they are in Hold'em. Not saying that PLO is funner, but I will tell you, four cards is just way sexier. So, as always, thank you everybody for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe. Please go ahead and share. My goal is at the end of 20 episodes to be at least at 1,000 subscribers. And uh, hopefully we can start incorporating some uh, live play in this. I do did have some videos posted before I did this series about live play, ethics, stuff like that. You can go ahead and search for that. But definitely hit the like and subscribe. I appreciate everybody. And as always, play smart and run like a god.